one extra me, so I'm sure that's enough to get started. Uh, welcome to the joint meeting for the Rules and Open Government and Committee of the Whole. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I think I'm, the, I think I'm the extra you. I didn't, I used your link, so. Oh, okay. You know how to change, uh, change the name? I, I do now. I didn't realize I was, that was the problem. Okay. Yeah, don't, don't confuse me like that there, Dave. Uh, anyway, uh, can we have a roll call, please? Davis? Here. Cohen? Here. Arenas? Here. Perales? Jones? Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we are going to start out with the agenda for December 14th. And we're gonna start out on pages four and five. And please notice that we have a 11 o'clock start time for the regular session. Hate to ask this vice mayor, but I feel compelled to do so. Does that mean that closed session needs to start at nine instead of 9.30? Um, City attorney. Are we gonna have a closed um, session? I had to unmute. Thank you for the uh, question, Councilmember member Davis. Um, right now I tried to keep closed session cleared so that because we were having an early start, that's why we had a big agenda um, this past Tuesday. Um, I will probably put uh, a matter on um, potential litigation um, relating to redistricting, um, but that will be it. And, um, but right now there isn't a closed session. So if we do it, we could do it at, at 9.30. I don't think it would be a tremendously long session, but um, sort of up to you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. So we did four and five pages six and seven. Pages eight and nine. Pages 10 and 11. On page 10, uh, item 2.13, the water, uh, Valley Water, um, Purif uh, purified water project. Um, I was going to, I would pull that from consent. So we might as well um, put it on the regular agenda. And I'll keep, I'll keep the conversation as short as possible, but I we would. Can, we can move that to another numbered item. I appreciate it. Okay, pages 11 and 12. Thirteen and fourteen. Okay, um, Lee, I'm going through each each item on page fourteen. I see we have um, Team San Jose deferred. Your district. Yes, is. Team San Jose has been deferred to January 11th. Got it. Redistricting is last on the agenda. And the Charter Review Commission, I, I believe there's a recommendation from the clerk's office on, Vi on that. Vice Mayor Chappie, this is Troy from the clerk's office. Yes, we recommend deferring item 3.5 to January 11th. Great, thank you. And uh, Lee, is that... Uh, Sound workable? Yes, that absolutely sounds workable. Okay. All right. Um, that's page 14 and 15. 
What's she doing, dude? She has, she's been really like working on cardio. So on page 15, the 3.6 must be, is that a must? Yeah, so 3.6 uh, is a must. It does need to be heard by the end of the year. Okay. But it's very similar to last night's action um, on a similar project, so they're usually straightforward and shouldn't take a lot of time. Okay, and 3.7. Scroll down. Um, that's up to the Rules Committee. It does not need to be heard by the end of the year for any legal reason, so that could be deferred into January. Okay. Well, I guess we'll speak to that during our discussion. And that's page 16. Um, on page, again, on page 16, item 5.1 is deferred. Yes, we are recommending deferral to the 25th of January. Great, thank you. And then on page 17, 6.1. That does need to legally be heard by the end of the year. Okay. And that's on page 17, page 18, 6.2. So 6.2, um, it can be deferred into January, but it's, it's fairly straightforward um, and staff would like to have it heard by the end of the year. So you're saying it won't be time intensive? Um, yes. Or, okay. It should not be. Great. So that's page 18, on to page 19, um, 8.1. That does need to be heard by the end of the year. Got it. And then open forum, and then land use, got the consent calendars. And then on page 20, 10.2. Two is deferred. Ten point three opportunity housing and as part of the general plan four year review. I know that it's something that we must do in this in this council meeting. Yes. Um, continuing on page twenty one on ten point four. Any comments on 10.4? Uh, it needs to be, um, we, we feel on staff 10.3, uh, 10.4, and 10.5 should all, right. all be heard on this agenda. Got it. All right, so, and 10.5 is on page 22. And that is it for the agenda and when we go Back to the committee. There's also an ad sheet. If the maker of the motion can include that, that'd be greatly appreciated. And now we're going to go to the public. And Lizette. Go ahead. Take yourself off mute and go ahead. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to you. We're gonna go to Blair. Go ahead, Blair. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. A really interesting couple of days of meetings. Thank you. Um, I wanted to speak uh, on the 10.4 items of uh, Urban Village. You had it, uh, that was at, uh, council last night. Thanks that I was hearing the first words uh, uh, starting to, to talk about mixed income ideas. Uh, that was nice. Hope you can keep up the efforts of uh, ELI, VLI, and mixed income. 
for the future of urban village planning. That's awesome. Um, and to really be aware that in the next year, we're going to have to talk about the future of uh, subsidies that want to be used for urban village developing. I think we need to really question that, and I hope we'll be ready to do that. Um, there's a few other items. The, uh, there's going to be uh, rate issues for local community energy. I think we, I hope we can really rally to defeat the recent CPUC and PG&E ideas of uh, uh, hike rates and rate hikes, rate hikes and solar things. Uh, they have a really backwards plan as usual. I think they're trying to find ways so people will like just convert in droves to local community energy. But I think it's a bit of the wrong approach. It's a bit too competitive and capitalistic, and it, it, it brings out the worst of ourselves. I hope we can do it in, in much softer, gentler terms. And uh, so please say no to the PG&E stuff. And, and good luck with our own rate issues that I think are a bit confusing that, that mirror PG&E ideas. Really talk about subsidy help that people can have at this time and make it clear to people and make it, bring it back soon, bring back cheaper rates soon. Let's really work towards renewable ideas. Uh, and about uh, charter review stuff, you know, in the next year, just to be make things clear, if you need the help, um, uh, you know, people can, uh, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, uh, Lizette. Go ahead. Take yourself off mute. Can you? I don't know, Lizette, if you're having some issues. Uh, oh, there you go. Go ahead and start speaking. Um, can't hear you. Um, so we're gonna go to the next speaker, uh, Jill. Go ahead, Jill. Uh, I tried to push it. Can you can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I wanted to comment specifically on the amount of land use items that come up at these meetings and the difficulty that I've personally had with only one minute um, and say last night there were, or excuse me, the last council meeting, there was just a collection of land use items that fell under the general plan for your review issues. Um, so I tried for in one minute, I think maybe even had 30 seconds, I don't know, maybe no one minute to explain five different ideas I had in my head and none of which I think I really conveyed very well. So I'm hopeful that as we go forward, I know this won't happen again for another four years, but when we have land use items, it would be very important to say, hey, when we give the public one minute and we consolidate three to five items within one little grouping, that really doesn't give anyone a chance to articulate exactly a thought that could even be helpful to you. So then, in fact, it's almost just not worth it um, for you guys to have to kind of tolerate our smattering of, you know, like incoherent message. So I'd like it if we could figure out a way to have land use items have their own item. So I could have spoken a minute on signature products, excuse me, um, signature projects, a minute on, you know, the commercial component. I know that's coming up separate, but anyway, that's just a thought. And on this one, I'm happy to see that um, it looks like maybe there's only one or two within each grouping. Uh, it would just really help. And also, if we could do it not every four years and at the very end of the year, at the very last meeting, we have 10 things to talk about. I would love it if we could figure out a way to spread out the conversation of how our general plan is, is, is going. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I, I agree with the, the last caller. This is, this is how, if, if you can't get the public with the policy issues, then you circumvent democracy by doing what you're doing now. I, we all already know. Licardo is going to say one minute, and I don't put it past him to put it down to 30 seconds. Okay, we are people, we don't have the kind of power to exert within this context, but yet we're a democracy, and the word itself, demos 
gratis. Power of the people. Okay, so th this isn't the power of Ricardo. This isn't the power of, of oh, well, the agenda. Oh, well, we got all these items that we got to take care of. No, nah, I ain't trying to hear that. So this, this particular uh, agenda, it needs to be cut in half. It absolutely needs to be cut in half. There's too many land issues. There's way too many land issues to discuss. That consent calendar, you have at least two items that need to be taken off of there. And I would like to hear Nora speak on the record whether or not I as a citizen can pull an item from the consent calendar because it states it on the record. It states it on the agenda that I do have that ability. But Locardo has circumvented that. It's against the law. You guys like talking about the law? This is against the law. So I would like it now stated openly from Nora whether or not I as a citizen have the ability to pull from this consent calendar an item that I would like to hear discussed with respect to what, you know, what the meeting that happened earlier today, it's absolutely necessary because I have some arguments that I would like to articulate within the context of, of pulling from the consent, but I don't have that ability because the call is. Thank you. Um, before we go to the next speaker, Nora, I know that you've spoken to this before, but can you just reiterate what you've told us in the past about a, a citizen's ability to pull an item off the consent calendar? Sure. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor. The, uh, the idea with the consent calendar is that the council is going to vote on all of those items at one time. And the only reason that something and, and getting pulled is sort of a misnomer, but there are uh, the only reason someone would um, pull an item to use that term, someone on the council is because they're going to vote no on that item. Otherwise, uh, they have to they have to vote no on consent, and there and there may be a number of other items that they would um, positively vote on. And so that's why the council has the ability to pull an item for a separate vote. Otherwise, the entire consent calendar is to be um, addressed together. And then the other uh, reason, and we had an example last night, I guess it was last night, it was last night, it only seems like it was four days ago, um, where there, one of the council members had a conflict. And so he could vote on everything else, but he couldn't vote on that. And his obligation under the charter is to vote if he's there. And so that uh, one item had to be separated and be pulled. But yeah, the reason that the council, that it's the council that can pull items is because consent is to be yay or nay. Um, as a whole. So that's, that is the explanation. Thank you, Nora. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian. Thank you. I, I, it, it says, it, hopefully I have to go back and look, but it says right on the agenda that people from the uh, public can pull uh, consent items. And in Santa Clara, you can at the council meetings, at school districts, you can. And um, I think the gentleman has a point. I understand it could get used where you pull every item off the consent calendar and it could be used just to tie up stuff. But I, I, if it says it right on the agenda, um, and I'm going by memory, I do know that you can pull from consent on, on pretty much every other forum up through maybe county. I know the county may not let you in the state, they don't let you obviously. Anyways, I'd like to bring up, yeah, I, one or two minutes isn't enough time to articulate. I just want some way for the council to say to us, that you actually read our emails. And I know I keep harping on this, but there was a phone issue. There was one of the signs had a phone number on it that was dead. It took six months, actually longer than that, to settle this little issue. And it, what, I didn't do it to drive home the, uh, to, because I'm you know, real predictive about, but to drive home the point that there's something broken when it takes that long to do something that simple. And I'm not the only one that says this, people on the council have said the same thing. If I could just hear, yes, we do read your emails. I, I don't expect people to agree with me. Most likely they won't. But a lot of us walk away from the stuff that goes on, honestly thinking that about 95 to 98% of the stuff is already set before there's even public comment. And I probably I'm wrong on that. It's probably more of a, an a emotional response. But optics are important too. And I think folks sort of understand what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last public speaker. So we're going to go back to the committee. 
Council Member Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, I'm happy to make the motion. I did want to ask if we could have a time certain on 9.5. I've had some requests for that. That's the SB9 implementation. It is um, the last item before we're going to talk about the uh, redistricting. So I was wondering if we could do a not before, and I would like to know what um, we, you might think a good not before for 10.5 would be. Wow, that's a good question. Uh, Lee, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna toss that one over to you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to help phone a friend here, but Gloria, really? can I ask you to chime in to ask if 10.3, um, 10.4, 10.5 were um, noticed for any specific time on this agenda? Um, I believe they were noticed for 6 p.m. Uh, I was looking for somebody from housing to be on right now. I'm not housing, sorry, planning. Um, and I don't see anybody just there. It looks like they were because it actually says there's an evening session. So I wouldn't yeah. be surprised, but I'm wondering if we want to do a not before, do we want to just say not before six or and then have it as close to six as possible? Or do we want to say something more realistic like not before seven? And you're, are you, you're looking for me to, to help with that? Council I member? mean, you, Vice <laughs> Mayor. Hey, I, hey, Deb, I, I, can, I can, I can throw out some numbers, but you know what that's worth. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I, I would, it, just my, uh, it, this is more personal recommendation. I, I would say not before six, just because it's been noticed on that. Yeah. Um, and that might give you a bit more time than saying versus seven o'clock, because if it does end early, you're not butting up almost, against it the curfew for redistricting. That's true. We almost never end early, but you know, it I was trying I'm trying to be optimistic. Yes. Well, that's why I asked the vice mayor. He always gives us optimistic recommendations as well. So I'd like to put 10.5 as uh a not before 6, which I think it already is, but um maybe then it'll we'll hear it before um 10.3 and 10.4 potentially. Um, and then, so I'll, I'll make the motion to approve the agenda with the staff recommendations for the deferrals, the ad sheet, moving 2.13 to a, um, from consent to a numbered item, hearing 3.4 last, moving 3.5 to January 11th. And then I think I wrote down 3.7. Are we also deferring that to January? I don't remember what that one was. Project labor agreements amendments. Yeah, and deferring that 3.7 to January as well, just to clear some things out. So that's my motion. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Council Member Cohen? Um, well, first, I wanted to ask that we keep 3.7 on the agenda next week. Um, I think we can get through that efficiently um, and get it done. We've, people have been waiting a while for this and it would be good to have it done before the holidays for people to have some um, certainty. And it, yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's gonna be a huge amount of discussion on the council, but I, I would think that we can get it done, especially if we're deferring all the other items forest management plan and and charter are the big ones that I think would take away more time. Um, so my preference is to leave that one, but I support the rest of the recommendations. Um, I also have a question about charter review just for staff, just to confirm um, if we've deferred that to January 11th and council has a desire to um, have something ready for the June primary ballot, like if there were a recommendation from the charter that have had some time sensitivity and we needed to craft a ballot measure and bring it to the ballot for June. Would, would, is there still enough time to start that on January 11th and get that ready for the registrar and have it on the ballot for June? 
So I don't know, Joy, if you have the specific date um, for the June election, but typically if we're placing something on a June ballot measure, we would need the council to approve that during the first meeting of March, typically, so March 1st, um, for placement on a June agenda. So that would give you, um, you know, roughly two months, January and February to sort that out. So we could approve that and we could we could make the, the um, recommendation that we want to come back with a ballot measure in January. It could be crafted in February and approved in March. There would be there would be enough time for that. Correct. OK. OK, thank you. Um, so I'm OK with the rest of recommendations. I'd, I'd like to ask whether Councilmember Davis is OK with um, some of the amendment to keep 3.7 on the December 14th agenda. I, I'll be honest, I, I'm not interested in that because it can be deferred. And I know that project labor agreements um, from the last two times that we've done it always have a ton of public comment. And we're going to have a ton of public comment on redistricting. So I'd really rather save the time for the item that is um, has a deadline. Okay. And council member. Cohen, are, um, are you up? Are you done? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there and see if there's any other comments from other members of the committee. And that, that, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And Vice Mayor, may I interrupt for a second on the timing sure. of the land use items? Um, under uh, the council um, policy, land use items are supposed to be heard um, in the evening. And uh, at either if you know you can say at six o'clock or no earlier than six or however you want to do it, um, unless planning staff with the concurrence of this committee um, requests an afternoon hearing. So technically, it should go, those should go in the evening. Just so you know. Great, thank you, Nora. Uh, Councilmember Arenas. Uh, thank you. I was also interested in um, uh, shortening up this agenda um, because there's so many items here that are going to have lengthy discussions. Um, I was actually more interested in maybe having some of the general plan discussions like the opportunity housing piece go to January. I know that um, that the SB9 um, emergency housing uh, emergency ordinance needs to happen in December, but I wonder if we could take the opportunity housing um, uh, because that that I think that uh, aside from everything else on the general plan, I think everything else should be okay. Um, but I'm wondering what my colleagues think about that. Um, I don't know that there is any urgency on uh, the opportunity housing conversation. And if we could delay that to January, that would be great. Um, I, you know, I just caught myself with the three points. So I, I was very confused about all the numbers. There was a lot of numbers going around. I'm so I'm sorry. I do want to be supportive and, and move as many things around to January. I do think um, I've got to say that last week, I, you know, was it last week or the Oh gosh, I don't know. These weeks are just blending in now. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a point where, you know, there was a, a article that was um, written by Spotlight and it really detailed um, some of the vi violations um, for um, that were happening in our, our very own construction sites. And so for me, I guess it, it, it would be more important to have the the PLA discussion sooner than than later because it does relate to uh, the you know the people's livelihoods and their well being. Um, the opportunity housing is something that's very far in the future. Where it's not you know it's not rolling out. We're not going to. Uh, it's not a, a thing that that needs to get discussed this month. And so I wonder if maybe what we could do is a little bit of swapping, swap, the, <laughs> swap the the opportunity housing for January, keep the PLA for this month, um, so that way we can keep things at a. I don't. I can't even say at a minimum because we have so much on the agenda. It's not a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
and, and let's not jinx it and say that it, we're going to end early. <laughs> We've learned our lesson. <laughs> Anyways, that, that's my suggestion and uh, hoping to hear from everybody else. Um, can we hear uh, from staff uh, whether opportunity housing is something that could be pushed out or if it makes sense to tackle it at, at this council meeting? Yeah, uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm going to refer to Rosalind Huey, who is closer to this and can better speak to what that would do to the overall project. Right. Thanks, Lee. Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. Um, staff would recommend, because these two items are so closely tied, Opportunity Housing and SB9, that they actually be heard together. Um, in staff recommendation for Opportunity Housing, there are some implementation items. Um, that we are recommending that will align with um, SB9. So we think it's very important to have one conversation. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's, it is gonna be challenging and, and probably a lengthy meeting regardless. Um, and I actually, uh, because I was present for the last PLA discussion, I, I actually am confident it is going to be a, a lengthier discussion. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. And I think there may be, I, again, I've, I've been part of that discussion. I kind of know where I landed last time. And, um, you know, so I know where I'll land this time. Uh, but there are others that may not. And so the conversation may go on. Um, but I, I would be comfortable trying to, to to take up that item and land that plane as quickly as possible uh, and just make it an up or down vote uh, depending on where people stand. Um, but I'm, I'm not super confident it'll be quick. Um, that'll be up to, I think, uh, everybody on, on the dais. Um, I, I, I'm comfortable though with, with uh, keeping that in and it looks like we wanna keep in um, and I would be interested too on the rest of the land use issues. The, the one I was slightly concerned about was the uh, commission uh, conversation, uh, the Charter Revision Commission. Uh, Councilman Cohen asked my question in regards to, um, I guess, timing of that. My concern was, you know, it sounds like we could still squeeze it all in in time, but I think it doesn't allow much opportunity for, you know, more, more discussion or time to digest what the interests uh, and concerns may be. Um, so I just wanted to hear from staff again sort of what what is that timing and, and maybe what would the pressure be right if we we didn't hear that item what what is the recommended deferral uh going to be to recommending to have it heard for the january 11 uh, meeting council member and, and then if you can give me an idea again on the sort of what the timeline will look like to try and get something for that june ballot uh for that question can i defer to nora or if mark is uh in here, Mark Manny from City Attorneys. Yeah, go for it. I, I don't think Mark's here. So can I have the question? I'm, I must, wasn't sure what. Uh, the question, uh, Nora, Sorry. was if we uh, make a decision on January 11th for the Charter Review uh, Commission recommendations, Okay. Uh, and we want to put something on the June ballot. When would that have to be okay. finalized? I'm, I'm, yes, I'm. I'm sorry, and Mark's Mark's not on. I think Mark's probably asleep, but he's had some really long nights. Um, the uh, it, I believe it's it's a date in May in March. I don't know the exact date um, that uh, we would have to get have a vote and get something approved for the June ballot. March um, 1st, um, okay. you back up from the election day, 90 days. So the, the council would need to vote to place something on the ballot by March 1st. But, okay. but I had, gives it. council member, I'm sorry. I had heard that it would be um, a November ballot if there were going to be changes. And what I don't know, and Mark would know is whether or not it has to be a November ballot. I can try to look that up. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the anticipation was a June ballot. Okay, I thought some of the considerations had a time sensitivity to to want to be considered in June. At least that was my understanding. 
and that that may very well be the case. And if it if it can go on a June ballot, then there would have to be um, uh, that decision, that vote by the council to put it on a June ballot would have to occur, uh, Lee saying March 1st, but I know it's early March. Okay, that's fine. I think that does give us enough time then. So I'm comfortable with that. Uh, I don't think we had a change in the motion yet, did we, to reflect the 3.7 item being heard? No, there hasn't been a substitute motion. I okay, I'll, I'll make that substitute motion. I think Councilmember Davis, you said you didn't want to accept that, correct? Really don't want to make this meeting any longer than it absolutely has to be. And I don't think it absolutely has to be there. I think we can do it on the 11th and it's gonna be a delay of very little time. Okay, so I'll make the substitute just, and that would be the only change from the underlying motion. Uh, would be to to, to add 3.7 back onto the agenda. Second. Second. Okay. That's it. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Cohen? I was going to make a substitute motion, but I don't have to now, so I guess I'll lower my hand. All right. Um, so we have a substitute motion. Uh, no more comments. So um, can we get a roll call vote, please? Davis? Nope. Cohen? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Peraldas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. All right, motion passes. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the public record. And I go to the public. And we have one hand raised. Paul, go ahead. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. To think that Blair doesn't get paid, or I don't know, maybe he does. I, I, I don't know. But this dude puts in a lot of work. When you read what he wrote with respect to the uh, data collections, that's already been happening. A couple of years ago, we had that stingray that was installed by the deputies. It's installed downtown. It just picks up, it, it mimics the, the, the cell phone signals, and then it just extracts all the information from your phone. And then you get people like Rob Lloyd sitting there laughing and, and joking, yeah, 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 data, 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 data. We got all this data, yeah. I mean, this is, it's becoming like vulgar and, and sickening because you are creating like these models on how to message. And what that means is basically, it's a mass psychology. It's, it's, it's playing with people's minds because you've extracted information about their lives and then you think that you could quantify how to direct messages in people. Remember, I've been locked up. I don't, I'm not connected to that kind of psychology out here. And you can't quantify what has happened to natives and Mexicans. How are you going to quantify racism? How are you, how are you going to quantify what it means to be genera genera generationally impacted by economics, uh, by economics, by politics, and by uh, uh, having, having a certain social station within the community? How do you quantify that? Why don't you guys get into your computers and try to quantify that? You can't. Why? Because it requires a human being. Because it's about human experience. That's something that you can't put into a computer data point and 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 uh, type it in and get it out. But these 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 mass surveillances that is going on, especially with that Wayfair uh, uh, technology. Come on, man. We need more information. Thank you, Blair. Hi. Uh, thank you. I've been writing letters to yourselves for months now uh, about the future of does the city charter commission have to work on a legal language through January and early spring 2022. Is that an item that can be handled by the city's attorneys for a legal language for the June ballot? Uh, good luck in how to work on these issues uh, and thank you for bringing it up today. Uh, I, my letter was about the uh, I simply wanted to report on the uh, recent uh, 
crime issues and, and the fact that we have already uh, a ton of uh, new uh, 4 and 5G and smart LED light technology that it has an incredible amount of surveillance capabilities and data collection capabilities. And we have to learn to talk about that openly. That has to be open subject matter. Um, and we have to talk about you know, how the future of ALPR camera use is more slated for the future of Vision Zero projects and, and how all this will be connecting. Meanwhile, we're not having all that good luck with good accountability practices with Vision Zero and the KSI statistics issues that we're just starting to better address that we need to be clear what exactly we're doing with ourselves. I don't think we can just dump in a whole bunch of new ALPR stuff and say, here's the miracle. You know, it takes, you know, direct police work to, to address, you know, these organized crime units. It's not all in the surveillance. And we have to be real clear and accountable about ourselves, what we're doing. That's all I'm asking. And, and just that we're clear about it and, and really respect that we're trying to build a, a future of, of reimagine and equity at this time and take it seriously. And we can do this stuff and uh, good luck how we do it. it. It's our human heart. It's our good selves uh, to what we do. It's not the technology. Thank you. Thank you. Brian? Um, I have to reiterate that. Um, they, they're right. Blair puts in a lot of work. I have to do a lot of the other people on those notes that he writes. They're very, not notes, his letters he writes. They're very um, informative. And, and he's right about people. Um, Technology can help us. Technology can save lives, technology, but it isn't our soul. We're our soul. And if we lose track of that, everything else we're doing is absolutely moot. And we almost did that the last four years um, with, what's his name? No offense to people who voted for him, but we almost lost our soul you know, as a country. And that's scary. Uh, just a side note, I was, Yesterday was December 7th. Half the people I talked don't even know about that. Those people that stopped the empire from getting into the, the states saved this entire planet, just like they did in D-Day. And we have forgotten that. It's only 80 years ago. And we should shudder that if we ever forget that lesson, which I think we are. Now, I know that this, the, you, you ladies and gentlemen don't have a lot of control over that. And we're not supposed to talk too far outside. But each little thing where humanity is built back into whatever technology, that it's people first, because if it's not, everything else is fairly irrelevant. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for bringing it back uh, to the topic. All right. Um, bringing it back to the committee. Uh, Council Member Brawls, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was from before. I'll, I'll make a motion to note and file. Thank you. This could be long. Second. second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Ruth? Davis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Perales? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. On to the consent calendar. I go to the public first. Go ahead, Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you for the dumpster days uh, that you, you have listed here as many dumpster days. Uh, it just reminded me just, I, I haven't been speaking when I see them at, at, at these agenda items, but they, I think they do can do a tremendous service to all parts of a local neighborhood. It can invite all parts of a neighborhood. So it's nice it's back and uh, I'm back. <laughs> Talk, mentioning it at this time, and I hope it just offers a bit of uh, happiness and fun for ourselves and, and what, how we can kind of better communicate with each other at the local level, local neighborhoods. Um, I also wanted to, uh, I, I, I hope my previous comments, I mean, I, I meant it in neutral terms just for all sides to take heart in how we consider uh, the legal language questions of the charter that need to be addressed in the next few months, how we can go about that, good luck, you know, and how we can do that. I hope my own words can simply offer a bit of clarity how to work on the issue. And um, 
I, I, I have a bit of concern about uh, the city attorney's words about the um, how the uh, consent calendar can work. I think it's a bit more nuanced than what she described. It, it can be a place of open discussion time for council persons uh, and for public to ask council persons if if matters can be discussed. I think that has to be taken into account a bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul? Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Nora was wrong. Just, it's, she was wrong. And she's going to put a person that makes 500 bucks a month. I live on $500 a month and I eat at food banks. And she, I'm going to be forced to a position to where I have to file in court just to assert my constitutional right as a Chicano in this community. But that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. But that's what the city is going to be doing with a person like me, putting us in court. The consent calendar, I can't believe I've been doing this for like the past few days, but I've been in agreement with Councilwoman Davis. Now, I really want to thank her personally for, for, for thinking about the people at Evans Lane. Okay, I was a resident there. I've lived there before. So I know what the people go through there. You know, and, and, and this, is, this is a program that is specifically designed to help people that have mental health conditions that have... I mean, I'm, I'm talking about abuse. I'm talking about rape, both men and women. Uh, severe child abuse. I mean, just when you hear the stories of the people that live there and you're just like, it, it, this person is like a miracle of survival. I mean, people think that they got it hard on the street. People think, oh man, well, I ain't got, you know, I got to pay this bill. Pay. Man, you don't know what hard is. Really, go have a conversation with some. Sit someone down over there at Evans Lane and talk to them. You know, ask them questions about their life, and they will they will teach you something about survival. They will teach you something about resiliency, and they'll teach you something about humanity. Because despite the fact that people experience a host of challenges when when trying to interact with a world that has rejected them. These people still get up in the morning. They still show up. They still do what it is that they have to do. And you, you will be surprised on how much kindness, generosity, and compassion you receive. All right, uh, Jill. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman brought up the dumpster days, and I know it's on the, count, the agenda. I just wanted to give a quick shout out for um, the mobile home park I live in. I live in District 10 in Imperial Estates. I moved in here eight, almost nine years ago, and every single year, our um, the the actual owner of the park every single year brings in a dumpster and allows anybody in the park to dump what they need to for one day, um, you know, at no cost. It's a courtesy. It it does such a service for everyone here, in addition to keeping the city clean, in in addition to um, picking, keeping our park clean. And so I just wanted to honestly give a shout out because. Um, our, the park owner has been doing this every single year and it's on their dime is my understanding, um, which is a, a really nice thing that, that the owner has done. And so I think that um, in the future, if any other private you know, places can take that on and take that tax burden away from uh, the city, you know, providing that, which is good, I'm glad they're doing it. But I also just wanna make sure that you know that there are some really good property owners that are offering that solution as well. And I'm grateful and I just wanted to let you guys know that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Bringing it back to the committee. Can I get a motion, please? Approval. Second. Second. All right, Ruth. De Dev Davis. Yes. Cohen. Aye. Arenas. Yes. Peralta's? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna make a, um, a change to the order of the agenda because uh, the public record uh, appeal um, item, uh, Catherine Whelan is here and she has a short uh, time to, to be with us. So we wanna move that item up in the, on the agenda and I'm going to pass it over to Lee to start out on that item. Thank you, Vice Mayor. 
um, uh, as you recall, uh, rule committee directed us to come back um, from last week um, after discussion with an update and just wanted to say that is exactly what we intend to do is kind of update on the progress that the police department has been able to make um, good and bad. Um, um, but we do intend to continue to work with the applicant and are not asking the rules committee today for any decision as we do think it'll require additional time. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, Lieutenant Donahue and Deputy Chief Washburn for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Chief Washburn to kind of walk through the update. Thank you. And uh, Lieutenant Donahue, did you want me to go ahead and jump off now? I know you and I kind of discussed um, you starting out. I'm happy to begin with the update. That's that's no problem. I'll jump in after you. Just pass okay, very good. All right. Thank yeah. you. I'll remain unmuted. Uh, good afternoon. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Deputy Chief L. Washburn with the San Jose Police Department, and I oversee the Bureau of Investigations here at the San Jose Police Department to include the Family Violence Unit. One of my many responsibilities is oversight of the Bureau, um, as well as to ensure that we are delivering a high degree of customer service. That's extremely important. Um, after receiving direction from the Rules Committee via the Chief's Office, I did meet with the Captain and Lieutenant who oversee the Family Violence Unit in Investigations, and I directed the unit to review the case from July of 2020. Uh, the case was assigned to a Detective Sergeant in the Family Violence Unit to review the evidence at the time of the report, to contact the complainant and determine what additional evidence, if any, can be provided, and also to seek guidance as needed from the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office. Um, I do want to say before I uh, go further that I do recognize this is a public forum. I want to provide as thorough a summary as possible on this review and will subsequently do my best to answer any follow-up questions while also protecting the privacy of the involved persons. I wanna acknowledge uh, the importance of this fine balance. To assist in your decision-making, my goal today is to determine whether the criminal elements of Penal Code 273.6, violation of a domestic violence restraining order have been met. In order to do so, we have worked to answer two primary questions. Number one, was there a valid restraining order on file at the time of the alleged questionable purchases that I, from gun shops or establishments that supply um, sporting goods equipment as well as some um, gun parts and things of that nature that I believe was discussed in the last rules committee. So then again, to repeat, number one, was there a violation of the order on file at the time of the alleged or excuse me, was there a valid order on file at the time of the alleged questionable purchases? And the short answer is yes. What I can tell you is that at the time of the report, both a patrol officer who was assigned to the main lobby and the assigned detective in the family violence unit independently queried the database according to standard operating procedures and determined that the restraining order on file was issued after the alleged purchases, thus indicating no apparent violation of the restraining order on file. Upon reviewing the case and the restraining order in present time, meaning in the last week, the database does now reflect the fact that a restraining order did exist during that time period. I cannot provide a specific reason to the disparity or apparent delay of the information in the database, but I can tell you this is not a good outcome. At the conclusion of my update in a couple of minutes, I will provide some measures that we intend to take to ensure the verification of existing restraining orders when engaging survivors with the intent to prevent this from happening in the future. Question number two, now knowing that there was a valid restraining order on file, is there a violation of the order's conditions? The restraining order states that the restrained person cannot own, have, possess, buy or try to buy, receive or try to receive, or otherwise get guns, other firearms and or ammunition while the order is in effect. We have reviewed, excuse me, we have reviewed the available evidence. We have consulted the district attorney's office for guidance and we have coordinated with the complainant. And as of today, we have not been able to establish the elements of a crime. 
In summary, the verification of a valid restraining order does give us room to work. And we have not given up as referenced by the assistant city manager. We are reviewing some remaining options to prove that the elements of a crime have occurred. As follow-up, we intend to debrief the facts of this case with the family violence unit detectives as a case study to learn from its outcomes to better serve survivors. We are discussing options to ensure how we may prove the validity of a restraining order in the future so this doesn't happen again. And thirdly, we will address these new measures department-wide by means of a training bulletin. Uh, with that, I will answer any questions that you have. I also have the, um, in addition to Lieutenant Donahue with research and development, I have the Family Violence Unit Lieutenant Commander uh, Rob Lang with me here today as a subject matter expert to assist with any technical and or specific questions about operating procedures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other? Yes, Chair, I have a little bit to talk about before we move Go ahead, on. Lieutenant. That's all right. Thank you, sir. So um, one of the things that council brought to us and asked us to do is to reconnect the survivor in this case with the independent police auditor's office to take a look at the conduct of the officer from the body worn camera. Since we can't provide the uh, survivor a copy of that footage, we had the IPA's office uh, review it again. So this is the second look they've had at the footage. They reviewed it the first time under first review with IA and then a second time last week and they reached out to the survivor to talk to her about it is my understanding. Um, I'm not sure if that's happened yet. I haven't had to, a chance to talk to her since last week, but I know that the IPA was planning to, but I also know that they did review the footage and they uh, discovered that there was no misconduct on the part of the officer from the body ward camera footage. Um, beyond that, where we are now, um, as Deputy Chief Washburn spoke to, is we're kind of at this this crux where the committee has this decision to make. Do we do we make a decision on the appeal to release or not release the body worn camera footage? Or do we pause that decision until a final determination can be made on the ability to establish those criminal elements that the deputy chief was talking about. And ultimately what we're asking the committee to do right now is to just give us a chance to finish looking at the case. Let us can finish the thorough investigation that the Bureau of Investigations is doing right now and see if we can establish those elements. And if we can, then the, it'll be a moot point and we'll be releasing the video footage because she would be the victim of a crime. If we can't, we'll report that to committee and why, and um, have that hard conversation at that time. Great. Thank you, Thank Lieutenant. You. Um, Kat, I know, Amanda, you have your hand raised, but I was going to also see Catherine, you have your hand raised. Um, go ahead, Catherine. I'll let you speak first. I don't think that Catherine was added as a panelist to be able to speak was why I had my hand raised. I don't see her in the- She's uh, one of the attendees. You can, uh, Catherine, go ahead and unmute yourself. And we just- Yes, I wasn't a panelist yet. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. I can now speak. Um, I wanted to address a few things um, specifically, you know, I wanted to state that it was really great to hear what, um, and I, pardon me if I get your title wrong, but um, Ms. Washburn, uh, I, I don't recall um, the chief of exactly what, um, I really appreciate that they're going to use this to help survivors and as a case study. Um, I do want to point out when I spoke to the IPA, they had told me the same things that they had already spoke to me about. Um, Lieutenant Don, who said that they reviewed it when I spoke to the person at IA, which I could get their name later on. Um, they had actually said they're not allowed to review the footage. So I don't think it's been reviewed twice. Um, I also want to kind of speak about this misinformation that keeps getting projected into this because I feel like at this point, a year and a half later, 
we should be relying on facts. And at the last meeting, um, I realized, you know, that many things were still being misrepresented and especially in regards to the TRO, which we finally have established um, a year and a half later that I did have one. Um, but there were also other um, falsehoods and just, it felt like dismissiveness and gaslighting um, being a survivor when, when I hear these things being told as they are facts and you guys are hearing them presented as facts and yet it is not factual to the case. Um, I spoke to Ms. Washburn today um, disclosing that um, and you know, my thoughts are a little bit disorganized at this moment because um, it is very traumatizing when I have this happen to me. Um, so maybe it would be best if Amanda goes first and I could collect myself to address some of the, the things that I wanted to. No, no, no worries. Um, we're going to go to Amanda and then we'll come back to you, Catherine. Uh, Amanda? Sure. I, I had a couple thoughts um, and I've spoken with Catherine about this is, you know, when she received a letter um, denying her, her Public Records Act request to have the body camera footage, she was supplied with a letter saying that uh, you would be entitled to that body camera footage if you were the victim of a crime as defined in uh, subdivision B of section 13951 which we looked up and it says that crime means a crime or a public offense wherever it may take place that would constitute a misdemeanor or felony if the crime has been committed in California by a competent adult, regardless of whether the suspect is arrested for or charged with the commission of the crime. So I guess my question would be considering that second part of regardless of whether the suspect is arrested or charged, considering the crime is the restraining order violation and the investigation is still pending, she is still categorized as I see by this definition as the victim of a crime. And I don't see why she can't get access to that body camera footage. So that would be one point um, that I have. Another is, you know, I'm disappointed to hear that no conduct violation was found for um, the courtesy aspects of her complaint. Um, like Catherine pointed out, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear if the body camera footage was actually reviewed. I'm also, you know, in Catherine's account, which I 100% believe I was incredibly um, concerned as a domestic violence advocate with the way she was treated. It was not trauma informed. It was not appropriate. She was treated like a criminal when she was trying to access safety from SJPD, which is extremely concerning for me as a domestic violence advocate. When we're looking at survivors calling the police to try to access their safety and protections that they're entitled to it's discouraging for survivors um, to wanna to go back and report to police to access their safety and it puts survivors at extreme danger. So I am disappointed to hear um, that it was found upon second review that the courtesy was not violated. And I'd like to hear more about why that is. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm gonna to go to uh, Siobhan who uh, has her hand raised. Uh, Siobhan, did you wanna weigh in? Oh, I just want to provide some facts. Um, our office did do, when the complaint initially came in, we uh, reviewed the body-worn camera and we agreed with the, um, the findings made by internal affairs. Um, there, was two, there were two allegations in the initial complaint. Um, one was sustained and one was not. And our review of body-worn camera, in our review, we, we felt those findings were supported by the evidence. Um, after... Um, Lieutenant Donahue reached out to us. We did uh, look at the body worn camera a second time and we came to the same conclusion. Thank you. Um, Catherine, um, do you feel comfortable um, speaking now or do you want to wait? Yes. Um, thank you for letting me collect my thoughts because it, it was a shock to hear what did Lieutenant Donahue said, because it was not what I was told when I spoke to someone. So I got kind of flustered and um, I, I've been able to collect myself. Um, one of the things that was um, just touched upon is, you know, the criteria for what misconduct is um, in this case with courtesy. And I think, you know, my advocate put it used, you know, basically what I said in all my complaints is I was treated worse than a criminal um, seeking help and safety. 
So the courtesy piece, still, the, the, what they are saying in their wording is that I would have had to have had profanity, violence, or um, screaming against me from my understanding for this officer to treat me poorly and be uncourteous. And so I disagree with that interpretation and I just, I still have not really seen how that is accurate because I've heard other things from other officers and detectives stating that it could be so much as a shrug or eye rolling. Like when I spoke to Lieutenant Donahue, um, he had stated it could be something subtle that someone does that can be discourteous. Um, and so that's just for that point. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to um, the committee, uh, Council Member Arenas. Uh, Chair, I believe um, Siobhan still has her hand up. I wonder if. Oh, I didn't see it uh, go down from the first time. Siobhan, yes, did sorry. you want to? Um, I just wanted to give the, the committee the definition of courtesy. Okay, thank you. Um, and this was sent to um, uh, Ms. Reichenbach um, yesterday. So courtesy as defined is department members will be courteous and professional to the public. Department members will be tactful in the performance of their duties, control their tempers, and exercise the utmost patience and discretion, even in the face of extreme provocation. So when we review, we're, we're not just looking for profanity and yelling. We are looking for more nuanced ways of officers being unprofessional. And as I said before, we, we, did, we agreed with the IA finding on this particular allegation. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Arenas. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate um, everybody coming back together once again this week. I know that this, um, uh, our police department has done quite a bit of work to figure out what, um, to bring more uh, facts uh, to the forefront. So I really appreciate uh, that movement. Um, and I really um, would like to uh, see a, a, a conclusion to this. It is um, very frustrating to continue to hear a survivor speak up for herself and repeat herself. Um, and probably she's been doing this for well over a year, a year and a half, um, at least since my, my office um, made a, a first contact with with um, Esther from, from next door who had asked us to um, facilitate um, contact with, with the police department and in which they did. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we had an officer go out and actually take that report that um, Catherine spoke about last week. And so, um, you know, the system corrects itself when, when um, humans, because the system is only as strong as the humans that are in there, right? And we as humans will always have um, an oversight, we'll always have something, and nobody's perfect, and I completely understand that. And, and so I appreciate, um, Chief uh, Washburn, that you're taking this as an opportunity for us to learn um, and, and to uh, really push our, our, our police department in terms of um, what, what could we have done differently for in, in real life, right? In, in real time, um, because fortunately this has not created a, a greater threat. I'm, you know, Catherine is safe. She wasn't hurt, but that might not have been the, what ended uh, up in this situation if those guns were made available to that person and that person was in the same things could have gone very differently and we would have never known this this uh, misstep um in this miscommunication and so i want to thank Catherine for for continuing her advocacy and your willingness um chief in 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 creating this as a learning opportunity, but we have to make sure that our discouraging um, 
to see that what we do in practice might be uh, somewhat different for our survivors. Um, because I know that we've been working really hard um, to change the systems and to make sure that experiences are different for survivors of sexual assault as well as um, intimate partner violence. And so I, I want to um, go along with you, Chief, in that learning and to figure out how um, policy can better support um, and make this a, a real learning um, opportunity for all of us. And I don't mean, you know, uh, have Catherine you know this is not on your back Catherine this is you 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 will create change within the system in your advocacy and I want you to know that this will not end here whether you know the rule the rules committee approves or doesn't approve is one thing but separate from that there's going to be an improvement in the system um, because all of these people who you see on on screen um, I know that they're invested in making this better, not only for you, but all the, the, the women and men who, um, who you represent. Um, so I, I do want to make a motion to, de to, um, to delay this another week because I, I believe, um, Lee, this a week is what you said, if that's appropriate, um, a week. I don't know if, if you need more time than that. Um, but on the, if you need more time, I, I think I'd like to hear on a weekly basis, the update. Yeah, and uh, I, I know you and I were able to chat before, um, and now I'm looking at the calendar. We actually don't have rules next week, correct, Nora? So. We don't. So Sorry, our, first, our, our first rules committee meeting um, is actually scheduled for January 5th at this point. So that would give us a few weeks. Um, and I think to, to Deputy Chief Washburn's um, point, um, now that we understand the, re the restraining order is in place, now it's going through, um, trying not to say too much, but the, the process of establishing the crime, which could take more than a week, um, mm -hmm. I think given the uh, interstate issues that are at play here. Um, mm -hmm. So we can definitely agendize it for January 5th for an update. Great. Um, I think that's the only other solution. And, and yeah. Catherine, I hope that that could work for you. We can check in with you later to see if, if that date works. Unfortunately, because of the holidays, we will not have rules committee. And so I, that's the, oh, the next best um, uh, date that we can offer. And we can take that offline. Um, just, you know, la lastly, I, I just want to say thank you to our um, advocates and um, those folks who continue to work with our survivors. I know Esther is also on the line. Amanda, you and uh, between you and Catherine have articulated um, uh, some of the nuances in, in this case in a way that uh, has allowed all of us to appreciate and understand what has happened. And, um, you know, on, on, on behalf of our, our city of San Jose, um, if I can actually take that upon myself to do is, is to apologize to you, Catherine, for the way that you um, were treated. You know, I'm not making that determination of, of, of whether somebody was courteous or not, because I know that there's a, a legal process for that, but there's a lot of um, uh, body uh, and physical communication that goes along with how we connect with one, one another. Uh, you know, we, we, on a, on a weekly basis at our council meetings um, are probably not courteous to one another without using foul language. Um, and it doesn't mean that there wasn't a, a, a violation of courtesy, right? And so I, I want to make sure that you, you know that we heard that. We heard that, that you were not treated in a way that you felt um, you would have an opportunity to to be protected um and and for me that's that's a true concern a true concern because that only allows um our are the perpetrators of violence to continue to do what they're doing um and it lessens the opportunities for our survivors to report and so um, I really want to take this conversation offline so that we as a system can improve um uh, this experience, because this is, this is not an off, 
you know, this is not just off one example. This is this is probably something that happens and we just don't catch it. Um, and so now that we have, we, we have to make sure that we, we do our best. Um, and so just thank you everyone for your patience and, um, and thank you Amanda and Esther and, and Catherine. Uh, first of all, I don't know how you do it with those babies, but you focus and articulate so well. Uh, thank you so much for hanging in there. Thank you. So council member, that's in the form of a motion to, for them to come back on January 5th. It sure is chair. Thank you. Uh, can I get a second? Second. Great. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councilmember Brawls. I actually, I just noticed that we, we did have uh, Esther as a public commenter and we had two others. I, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll defer if you want to go to them and then uh, if I can pick it back up after. Okay. I, I actually wanted to have this discussion with, with Catherine because she has a, a, a short timeline like the last meeting. So I wanted to make sure that this discussion took place in case Catherine had to, to leave, but I'm not going to. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually good with that, too. I don't, if Catherine does have, I'll, I have short comments. So if Catherine does have to leave, I'm happy to, to make that uh, first. I Go ahead. Okay. So uh, I think uh, first off, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Washburn, I think um, you said it. Um, and I think it's just unfortunate, right, that uh, now on this, this not necessarily even a second look, but maybe third look, um, we are determining that there was the um, the oversight and somehow, right, we missed that that there was actually uh, a valid restraining order. And, you know, we, we, we don't want to have victims go through this length to try and, and get to that understanding, even if we don't end up having the elements of a crime here in this case, which will be a different, I think, concern or challenge um, for the survivor. But just the fact that we, we have missed something, I think um, I, I look forward to hearing back from uh, from you and uh, the department in regards to lessons learned on that and, and how we ensure that that, that does not happen again. Um, in regards to, I think what we're going to uh, defer our comments here or our decision until January, but if between now and then it is determined that there were enough elements for a crime and uh, then the survivor can actually see the video, we don't have to wait till the 11th for her to see the video, then at that case you guys can reach out to her and then maybe just give uh, the rules committee a, a heads up, right? That, hey, look, that was determined. And then we are gonna go release the video to her as soon as possible. Th that is correct, right? I will defer to Lieutenant Donahue to pipe in there. I think I know the answer, but I don't wanna misspeak. Uh, yes. That's my, thank <laughs> you, yeah. That's exactly what we're gonna do, yeah. Okay. That's my understanding as well. Okay, and, um, and I understand that that may take a, a little bit of time. To, to get to and so maybe we'll be back here in January anyways before that that decision is um, is made. Um, I, I to make sure I understand it correctly, what Amanda was saying in regards to the the video uh, sort of uh, the language around the release of it not necessarily requiring right um, uh, charges or a, or a conviction there that that is what this rules committee has an opportunity to make a decision on in regards to we could we could release the video. But the unfortunate circumstance would be we would be releasing it so then the general public can see it. And so I think in, in the spirit of that, we've already decided that um, that we, we don't want to do that because the survivor is asking us not to to release it to everybody. So we could, but uh, we've come to that agreement, at least here, that, that we're, we're not going to go that route right now. Um, and and then um, I think lastly, in regards to the, the, the concern and the complaint, it looks like Siobhan, can you just clarify, did you or your office actually review the body-worn camera? Because it sounds like Catherine was saying that she was told by somebody in your office that they, they did not see the video. Um, I believe Erin O'Neill, the assistant IPA, is in the group. And yes. She was the one who did the review, so um, I'll have her give that answer. Oh, sure. Yes, we, um, we review all body-worn camera when we do an audit of an internal affairs investigation. Um, this was my case that I reviewed and presented to our staff. Um, so I reviewed it when I first initially audited the investigation, and then I re-reviewed the body-worn camera before speaking with Ms. Reichenbach. Okay, maybe if just somebody from your office can touch base with her and clarify why there was miscommunication, because it sounds like she understood that that somebody told her that they, you guys cannot or you did not review the body-worn camera footage. So I just think that that, you know, it, I thank you for the clarification here. Um, 
and I understand it may not be the decision uh, and, and uh, Catherine may not feel as though she agrees with your assessment as well as, as internal affairs. Um, we haven't seen that. We're not here to make that judgment as Councilmember Rodena states. I do know though myself from having been an officer and having complaints uh, go through both the, the IA and, 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 and uh, the IPA that there was an opportunity for um, officers to meet through mediation with uh, the complainant. And um, in certain cases that helped to kind of have a better understanding from, from um, the complainant side and then the officers to be able to just have a conversation. I participated in that once and it was extremely beneficial. Um, and the complainant, I think, understood the circumstances differently and, and, and actually, um, right, it was a complaint that was, that was not sustained. And so, um, you know, uh, at the same time though, I think that that opportunity to have that conversation was very meaningful. Our police officers are public servants, and um, and I think that right the, the the interactions that we have with the community is super important. And as Amanda stated, in this case, even more so, right for people that we want to feel, uh, we want them to feel comfortable engaging with uh, police. Uh, I don't know if that was something that was explored in this regard, but I think I, I would encourage that um, if if it wasn't uh, not only in this case but in others. Those are my only comments. Uh, I appreciate it, and uh, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Amanda. I see you have your hand up. I just wanted to add, it feels like the goalpost keeps moving for Catherine with requesting this footage. Um, she has gone through IPA and IA and requesting the footage and appealing the footage and now is here a second time, you know, presenting to city council, presenting in front of the public to get what I strongly believe is her right to have, which is this body camera footage. And last meeting, um, it was said that the reason why she wasn't allowed to have the body camera footage was she didn't have an active TRO. Now we're here establishing for everyone there was an active TRO. And now there's another reason why she can't access the body camera footage. So it just feels like the goalpost keeps moving for her more and more. She has to come back here, you know, sacrificing time with her children, um, having the bravery and strength to come present in front of you all. And I just think this is unfair to keep putting more burden on her to continue with this process to access something that should have been given to her already. No, I appreciate that, uh, those comments, Amanda. Um, just to kind of refresh everybody's memory, um, when we scheduled this update, um, we were already informed by Lieutenant Donahue and his team that it was very unlikely that they would be able to arrive to, to any conclusion in a week. But we want to, to have at least a, a check-in and an update on what's going on and so that everybody's informed. But um, there is no desire to kind of to drag this out as, as long as possible. Um, uh, as, as Council Member Arenas has articulated that, you know, we have a desire to make sure that uh, Catherine's needs and wants are, are addressed and we're doing everything we can to try to come to a conclusion and a resolution as quickly as possible. So I, I apologize if if there's a perception that we're we're dragging this out or stretching it out. We're just trying to to come to a conclusion and answer as quickly as possible. Um, Councilmember Perales, do uh, you have your hand up? No, I'm sorry, that was from before. Okay. All right. Um, so we have the motion in a second. Uh, I am now going to well, see Esther. You raised your hand. Yes, I'm sorry. They was they transitioned me to a panelist, um, and sorry. I will keep this very brief. I do want to acknowledge when this case started a year and a half ago. It was different leadership at San Jose PD. Next Door Solutions has tried to get an MOU for the things that we were doing together with San Jose PD. That was not possible until the new leadership came in. We've had a meeting with the chief of police. We've been in touch also with the Family Violence Center, um, Lieutenant Lang. We are optimistic. We have an MOU in place and we have some specific strategies, including quarterly meetings where we can come together and talk about topics like this, because I will share with you, Catherine's case is one of many cases that are coming through our doors. We are the largest domestic violence um, service provider in the county. And so this is the gateway violence crime. We have serious issues of sexual assault, human trafficking, child rape, child abuse, but domestic violence is 
in our opinion, the gateway. It is the one that is going to have deep and permanent impact on children. The outcome of this case is going to be decided by the 5th of January. It is unacceptable how long it's taken for Catherine to get justice. I was with her the day that the police refused to take her order. I had to take it up to Eddie Garcia with help from the city council member to get somebody to take her order or to take the report. She had to go down there with Amanda to Mission Street. There was not a report at her home. If that happened afterward, I'm not aware of it, but she physically had to go and file the report. And thanks to the intervention um, at that point of the captain and, and the people that were in place, they took her, her complaint. But it's, as Amanda said, the, if, if we keep moving, you know, sort of the, the burden of proof, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem for the other cases that we're going to bring before you because it is not right that these trends are going unaddressed. I spoke about this in the reimagined public safety hearing recently. This is not a trend unique to next door solutions. It is happening with all five agencies. We really need the voice of the survivor and that experience taken seriously. We're happy to help with training. We're happy to help with advocacy. We don't want to have it escalate to this level, but I'm amazed at how hard it was to even get an answer from the independent police auditor during COVID, the police department, we were given so much runaround. I have a master's. I'm no dummy. I'm the person that was on the phone trying to connect. And I can tell you, the public is not accessing justice. The IPA was not very responsive and helpful. And so there's a lot of processes. Even Catherine coming forward today, she was not explained that this was a public meeting. The clerk, the city clerk staff did not explain to her what was happening. And so she thought she was having a private meeting. So we need to tighten up our city processes. That is not right to do to a mother who is a survivor, who's still at risk from the perpetrator who's out there. And then to just have her tied up in all this bureaucracy and process that fails. I'm optimistic we can get the new leadership at San Jose PD to be more sensitive, to look at these issues. We're here. We have the documentation. We have the permission from the survivors. We don't want to delay the work on that. And so you will continue to hear from us on these issues, but we want to work with San Jose PD. We want to resolve them as quickly and effectively. As good as the leadership is of the city and the police department, or, you know, I think the problem is you have hundreds of other employees who may not share your philosophies. That's where we're running into problems. And so thank you for the support we do get from San Jose PD because they're helping us in other ways but we have a huge gap here that's affecting women and children. And we, we will continue to follow this and raise these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. All right, uh, that's all the comments. So I'm gonna go to the public now before we take a vote. Um, Paul? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, first of all, Senora Catherine, I empathize with your situation. On March 13th, I was sexually assaulted at a THU. I called the officer, Officer Vieira. If they showed up, exactly what happened with you, gaslighting you, making you think that you misinterpreted what happened. I was evicted as a result of my reaction to being sexually assaulted while I was wearing a towel by another man. And I was evicted on the spot. I went to a PISFIS meeting, and you can research this. It's March 13th. I went to the PISFIS meeting of this year to report exactly what it is that happened to me. As a result of my advocacy for myself, that it was wrong and that the way that the officers approached the situation was completely inconsistent with understanding that this is a victim of a crime that they're reporting. And so, number one, I was evicted. Number two, an officer that still remains unknown called up my probation officer and had me locked up for that. I did 45 days in jail because the officer didn't like the fact that I came to a piss fist meeting and snitched him out. This happens all the time. So I sympathize with you. I'm hearing everything that you're saying. And I'm just like, this has happened to the Chicano community for decades. However, we are not, we don't have the power to bring it to a piss, piss meeting. We don't have somebody like Senora Dickman that goes in and look at how much advocacy she had to go through. Secondly, is that the body worn camera, that camera footage 
belongs to me. When, when, when you put that on, that's not up to your discretion to determine whether or not I have access to it. The reasons why we got allocated body cameras is so, so that the eyes of the citizen is right there on the spot. And you can't, and so that the police officer can't fill out a report. With, he, he fills out the report without looking at it. Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon. Um, I agree with the comments by the previous speakers, and um, I'm appalled that this is how our victims of domestic violence and sexual violence are treated. And I'm just wondering if the law requiring, you know, someone only has access to the body cam footage if they are officially a victim of a crime that the police um, agree has taken place is a big loophole so that all they have to do is say, well, we don't think a crime took place, so no, you don't get to see the footage. It seems that the person making the call to 911 or, S or SJPD, however they're contacting, um, they should have access to the footage of their encounter with the officer. And they keep, you know, the people from the police department keep making this straw man argument Oh, well, you know, we can't let just anybody off the street. You wouldn't want just anybody able to see what happened. Well, the person, I mean, if someone can confirm that they are the one who contacted SJPD for the call, you know, to get the officer to come out for that encounter, it seems like they should have the rights to that footage and that being able to deny access to it, oh, well, a crime didn't happen, means that the police can get away with all kinds of things. Because the police need to treat people well, even if a crime was not committed in the police's opinion. You know, they need to treat the public well, even if the public, you know, is contacting something that they thought, that they thought was a crime, they were not just being, you know, random and calling for no reason. Thank you, Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you very much for everyone's work on this item. Um, I was interested in the words of uh, one of the persons of advo advocacy stating that it's hard in itself just to find uh, people within government who want to work towards our better practices. And, uh, you know, that's the goals I'm trying to work towards myself uh, with on the community level. How can we be more interested in our better practices at this time? What are we doing for ourselves to uh, to, to offer that of ourselves? I think uh, uh, new police chief Mata can do a very good job at trying to better address the future of domestic violence issues and the same of uh, Deputy Chief uh, Washburn. So I'm interested uh, how the growth will be with that and, and how Councilperson Arenas will work with the police that, that this kind of thing won't happen again, uh, you know, as much. I guess you have to say as much and that we really learn to really better, we can do a good job is what I'm trying to say. I need, we all need to learn to say that better. And um, so good luck how we can do that. Um, I think it's nice that we've admitted that the uh, the woman has had uh, her arrest warrants, uh, you know, stay away, stay away orders in place already. Thank you for doing that. The next step is, can we begin to address the body camera issue? Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be an issue of of, of giving that uh, things to. Uh, the person uh, as a public matter, can they do it within uh, a lawyer, uh, uh, the confines of a lawyer process? Can that be allowed? Client lawyer privilege, you know, in view with the police themselves. That way it won't have to be public. There can be many ways to work on the issue. That's our future also. Thank you. Scott. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Scott Largent. Uh, getting onto the meeting a little late, but I was actually looking forward to figuring out the outcome for uh, Catherine uh, regarding this chest camera footage, her investigation. Um, it, it just seems like we sent this poor woman 
in absolute circles. After watching last week's meeting, um, I kind of did a little more research on my end to kind of figure out what was really going on, where she originally went. Um, it, it's all the same players that I've dealt with for five years of chasing my tail with the city. And what the city did to this poor woman is ridiculous. Uh, she should have never had to, I mean, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but it, I mean, she should not have to go on to a government meeting and put her dirty laundry on the table, so to say. Th this never should have happened. And you guys should have done everything to prevent that, everything to support this woman. And, and I feel so bad for her. I have tried to do the right thing on my end, just as a concerned citizen. I, I, I don't want this way, way out in the public, but how do we change what has happened for hundreds of women that have to go through this right now? I've dealt with the family violence unit. I've dealt with trying to have San Jose Police Department enforce visitation orders, blah, blah, blah. When it's a civil order, they don't really care. They don't enforce it. They don't do anything. So the, the, the hoops that she had to jump through are similar to what I had to jump through to have my orders enforced to see my daughter. That basically never happened. You guys don't look at uh, restraining orders. You really don't care. You don't update them in your system. And I, and I don't buy it that, that, that she didn't have a legitimate claim coming forward. So I 100% support her. You guys need to do the right thing. And this was horrible to be in an open and public setting. This was just bad. I, I, I hope things change. I hope everyone's paying attention. Thank you. All right. Um, bringing it back to the committee, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Ruth? Davis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Arenas? Arenas? Yes. Perales? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. All right. So going back, um, so we are on item G2, and I'm, I want to take item G2 and G3 together. They're both uh, address ADA compliance and I'm going to go to the public first and take public comments. So go ahead, Paul. Uh, no, thank you. I'm, I'm good on this item, uh, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. You're welcome. Blair? Hi, thank you. Um, for this item, you know, for all the good work that everyone did on the last item, uh, I hope you can have a little patience for myself on this item. I think this is also, a, it is an item that you're doing some very good work about. It's about how uh, people of uh, small businesses can get loans for, um, you know, for uh, American Disability Act things that uh, can cover a number of issues. You know, there's uh, there's been a serious uh, litigation issues going on for small businesses uh, in San Jose recently, the past few years that this very much helps address. And I think it's it is the way that we always want to address these sort of issues. So thank you incredibly for for these for this work and efforts. I think it will help everyone out a lot. Um, there is, I think there's a COVID-19 component in this work, if I'm not mistaken. And I was hoping I could speak for a minute on that, just that uh, there's a real importance that I think we have to be in this country. We've learned to understand what can be a certain flexibility to understand the future of the vaccine process and the future of the community safety process that, the, that this issue is trying to address. You know, with new filters a business can, uh, air filters uh, a business can have, um, you know, mask use, sanitizer, you know, a whole bunch of things that a person can, uh, a small business can, can, can get a loan, I think, for this for. We're, we're finding a variety of, oh, mask use is important, of course. We're finding a variety of ways to address COVID right now that don't necessarily have to involve the vaccine process. I think we have to keep that in mind. We can't get locked into this mind frame that, that the vaccine is gonna save us all we, and make mandates about it. We have to can be flexible in this country towards other choices. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. 
Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm really glad to see the city considering these measures to assist small businesses comply with the ADA. Um, there's two main problems with the ADA. One is that it's enforced by a lawsuit instead of just being a set of requirements like fire code. And the other is that it's an unfunded mandate. Um, individual businesses, you know, bear the burden of complying and making their businesses accessible for people with disabilities. And for really small businesses, that is a big barrier and it's not fair that the predatory lawyers can come in and sue them and make disabled people look bad. <laughs> um, as part of the disability community, even though I don't have a mobility impairment, um, I support those who do and any one of us could be in a wheelchair tomorrow <laughs> um, and need accessibility. And we've had 30 years to solve this problem. And I'm really glad to see that the unfunded mandate part of it is being mitigated by the city and that they're going to help the small businesses meet these requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Victor. Hi, uh, Vice Mayor Jones, good to see you and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Victor Gomez with Pinnacle Strategy Consulting. Uh, my firm represents uh, the organization California Citizens Against Lawsuit Abuse. Uh, we advocate for small and medium-sized businesses who are really constantly hit with these frivolous lawsuits up and down the state. So I just wanted to, to thank the Rules Committee and, and those members that brought this forward uh, th for consideration to the council. Um, as many of you are aware, there are challenges in getting information around ADA compliance. Um, especially to our small business owners and also those in multilingual communities. Uh, I spent 17 years in the pizza industry, 10 of those as a franchisee, and keeping up with ever-changing laws is not that easy to do, uh, especially when you're in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of your business. So what you have outlined in your memo is greatly appreciated and will continue to help small business owners uh, come into compliance. So once again, just Wanted to share my my thank yous and and uh, really appreciate you folks bringing this forward and hope it makes it to the uh, city council uh, soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nate. Good afternoon, committee members. Thank you very much. My name is Nate LeBlanc. I'm with the San Jose Downtown Association, speaking on behalf of the association today. Um, just want to thank the committee for taking up this important issue. It's been very interesting um, to watch the, the um, kind of the civically engaged community, if you will, the chamber, um, the city council, um, our organization take up this important issue. I've watched uh, small businesses go out of business um, as a result of these lawsuits. I've seen um, people try to take measures to fight back about this, but not have the right um, tools to grasp. Um, so I'm just excited to see that we're taking a stand as a community to try to help uh, solve this and help small businesses stay in business at this important time. Um, I just want to also note that this uh, new grant is a great um, addition to a program that you already have in place and thank Juan Borelli and Swan Ha for their leadership and help in implementing the other ADA grant, which is um, uh, you know a reimbursement for city fees and contractor services um, when people make these changes. But this upfront money, um, putting cash in people's pockets to allow them to get these CASP inspections is a great way to approach this. Just really appreciate that you're taking it up and um, wanna offer the Downtown Association's help in getting this word out to our members and uh, we'll work closely with anyone who needs help implementing this when it's hopefully passed. Um, as I hope you guys put it forward today to go to the full council and there will be voted on unanimously. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. That's it for public comments. So I'm going to pass it over to Lee. I know you had um, two early consideration uh, forms that were done for both memos and I'm going to ask you to speak to your responses. Sure. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, we would just say, yes, we have early consideration forms for both G2 and G3, um, with the exception of one item, which is a yellow light. Everything is a green light and part of uh, work that staff can absorb. And staff from the Office of Economic Development and the City Manager's Office is here to answer any questions that the Rules Committee might have. 
Great. Thank you. Um, first, uh, I see Council Member Esparza. So, uh, Council Member, go ahead. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I uh, first off, I wanted to really acknowledge uh, your leadership. Um, on this issue for quite some time uh, and to thank you for all the work that uh, you've done in trying to um, make us a more equitable city um, as well as help our small businesses. Um, and, and so I, uh, I loved reading the memo from yourself and Council Member Foley and Jimenez. Um, and I saw it as a great compliment uh, to the memo uh, written by uh, Council Member Davis and Perales and myself. Um, and I think they're very complimentary in both short-term and long-term strategies. Um, and so thank you for your leadership. Um, and uh, I actually wanted to just start off by saying um, that I, I recognize that these memos um, are focused on the tools to help businesses become more accessible um, and the impacts to our small businesses when, um, when they're targeted by folks who are not trying to make uh, a business more accessible, but are, are, are doing it um, in a predatory way. Uh, there's uh, one gentleman who earned $7 million alone um, targeting uh, small businesses and, and uh, so I know in my district, um, I've had a swaths of Little Saigon, for example, or La Placita have businesses get um, noticed. And um, the discussion becomes, give me money, not help, help uh, you become more accessible for the community, which is really what the conversation that we should be having. Um, and, uh, and I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Council Member Foley's, um, I think it was her budget request. I'm trying to remember June 2021 seems so long ago right now. Um, but uh, the this council adopted in the budget um, in, in June, um, we called it a down payment, I believe, uh, in the budget document, in the final budget message, uh, to have a down payment to create an Office of Disability Affairs. And that's a really important effort that is already underway um, to staff, uh, to fund staff within the city manager's office, to gather input from stakeholders, prepare a report, develop a proposed work plan for the Office of Disability Affairs, sim similar to the process for um, the Office of Racial Equity. And so, um, so given that environment and the desire to make um, businesses more accessible to partner with our businesses and do that. Um, I know that Council Member Davis and Council Member Perales have had um, businesses in their district targeted. And again, those conversations are not how to make a business more accessible, but give me money so that um, to make this go away. And, and that doesn't seem to further the goal of that we have of ha making our city more accessible. And so, um, Vice Mayor, thank you for your memo. I know you'll speak to it, but I really appreciated the long-term strategies, the government relations strategies, how to finance some of this work long-term. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to, to um, our memo. Um, during this pandemic, um, we've had businesses in District 7 using loans to pay out settlements to the serial ADA lawsuit uh, filers. Um, instead of using that money to keep people employed, they're essentially have been using it to pay people off. Um, and the pandemic, as folks have brought up to us at council meetings, has brought challenges for folks with disabilities. Uh, remember when the buses were down early on in COVID um, and residents were frustrated. How do I get to an appointment? How do I, um, how do, I do what I need to do to live my life? Um, and so the pandemic has also brought some difficulties um, on individuals in our community. And I wanted to acknowledge first off that um, I think we all understand that the state and federal governments are responsible for the governance of ADA compliance. And, but as it has been stated so often, 
um, the city is is you know where where that line right there that line where that line of defense and we can't sit by while our small businesses are targeted and um, and our residents are not getting any more accessibility out of that, those efforts. Um, so uh, so I just I wanted to highlight that this uh, the proposal from Councilmember Davis and Perales and myself is very narrowly targeted to that short-term effort. Recommendation number one, direct staff to create a new grant program to small businesses who want to become ADA compliant by first initiating the inspections. And although the city currently has a grant program, one that was launched in February of 2020, um, it was set up as a reimbursement model, which created barriers for a lot of small businesses. And um, because they're putting the money up front and then they apply to have that money accredited to their building fees. And so this is problematic for businesses who would not receive that assistance until they were ready to go to construction. Um, and then others that have to deplete their reserves uh, to stay operable. Um, and so I think that this barrier has created um, uh, this scenario in which this program has been underutilized with only one business participating since February of 2020. So our proposal would provide small businesses with uh, funding up front to initiate the inspection, followed by the verification of completion of an inspection. And what's important is that this would also allow our small businesses to understand where they're not compliant and be awarded qualified defendant status while they're implementing the plan to become compliant. And so this program would be in addition to the current ADA small business program, but the existing program would shift to reimburse costs outside of that inspection. Um, and that's important too, because I mean, um, we learned of one business that had um, had something filed against them and really what they needed to do to remedy the situation was have a clearance for a fruit fruit stand <laughs> um, and then raise the height of, um, of the counter. And, um, and, and it helps if they need to know that upfront, then they can just go and do it and not wait to get sued for $50,000 or, or $10,000 um, for that. Recommendation number two describes an outreach um, an educational campaign to ensure that our small business, uh, our small businesses understand the importance of ADA compliance, the benefit of the inspection, and importantly, the potential pen penalties for non-compliance. Um, and so businesses want to be accessible. Being accessible is good for business. Um, with that said, there's a lack of educational resources for small businesses. Um, and many businesses are compliant or not compliant just because they don't have the information and, and they didn't know. They, they think, hey, I'm getting inspected by the city. That should be good enough. Um, and so, uh, so lastly, oh, and also on the outreach, we included some multilingual um, efforts in that, which is so important. During the pandemic, I personally went door to door throughout Little Saigon and then um, went door to door throughout La Placita and so many businesses there, those are mom and pops um, and they need that information. They're not, you know, they're doing everything for their business um, and, uh, you know, providing that information to them in their own language also helps create a more equitable environment for their customers, for their monolingual Vietnamese speaking customers, for their monolingual Spanish speaking customers. Um, and remember, ultimately, our goal is accessibility. Um, so lastly, our proposal includes having our intergovernmental relations team to bring back any legislation in the pipeline so as a city we can help advocate for improving accessibility uh, with our small business community while addressing the, the serious issue of serial lawsuit um, filers, uh, which has really caused damage to our small business community without increasing access for our residents. And so I just ask that um, the Rules Committee forward um, both memos moving forward so that we can 
uh, really start um, helping our small businesses and helping our residents increase their access as soon as possible. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I just want to speak to the, the early consideration response form. Um, I want to thank Council Member Esparza. She always has such very well thought out remarks and I never have much to add after she's after she's done. She's so thorough. Um, but I did want to ask that we got a yellow light on item two for promoting and marketing a new outreach program. And I wanted to ask, um, first of all, I'm, I guess I'm not really sure how this doesn't fit into the city roadmap because we did have a, a business resilience and recover, you know, recovery as part of the, the roadmap. And I, given that these serial lawsuits continued throughout the pandemic and have been harmed and council member Esparza, um, was, was clear about how some people were using their relief funds even to pay off this person. Um, I, I think it does fit in. So I want to make that point. And then the second thing is to develop a resource, even if we can't do proactive outreach, our council offices are very well connected with our business associations. So if there was a resource, we would be happy to promote that with our, with our businesses. And then also they could be added to the business tax notice, which goes out annually at different times. I know it's at different times of the year for different businesses. My husband got his just a couple of months ago. Um, and so that would be just the very, very basic stuff that I just really don't feel like should warrant a yellow light. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to make a motion and I, I hope I'm not stepping on you, Vice Mayor. I'm going to make a motion to move both items, the, both memos um, from Perales, Davis, and Esparza, and then also Jones, Jimenez, and Foley to move forward. I'm going to Take it. Thank you. <laughs> and Lee, if you want, if you want to respond to the the question about um, not being on the roadmap, I, I I guess I'd like a little bit more about that because I really do. We've we've talked about the importance of our small businesses and the Office of Economic Development helping our small businesses throughout the pandemic and recovery. And I see Nancy's raised her hand, so I think she probably wants to address it. So I don't I don't understand how this is not part of the roadmap. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to address um, kind of at a at a higher level, and then Nancy can speak to the specifics. Um, you know, I, I think because the subject happens to be on the roadmap, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a green light. Um, and you know, within in, within each one of those buckets on the roadmap, we've discussed with you and part of the roadmap exercise. There's a certain amount of work that we had scoped out as a part of the roadmap, and that we also kind of moved forward um, when we did the the budget actions related to the American Rescue Plan. So while it's very topical and you know, on the roadmap and topical because of what small businesses are going through, it doesn't mean that the city is necessarily resourced or positioned well to do it. Um, you know, based off of kind of the the scale of the work, I'll let Nancy speak to that. But I, I do believe staff looked at this as a very kind of separate and intense effort. Um, that given everything else we're doing in the way of communicating and, and partnering with small businesses in the recovery effort that we might not be able to, to pass muster on this. And so with that, I, I would ask Nancy to jump in. Good afternoon. This is Nancy Klein, Director of Economic Development. I just wanted first to start by saying really our staff really dug in and appreciated um, these memos because they really are showing us how to do what we do even better. So that first program about um, getting hand, dollars in the hands of people for inspections is wonderful and it really will help clarify as well as make implementable um, the steps so that they can get certified. And it will make the second program, which we have um, used more because it's not used enough, but people get stuck, I think, on the inspection end. So those, as you know, will take a little time to either develop and tweak. We, going back to the notion of the um, outreach, we absolutely agree. We can take 
what we have now and push it out. We don't believe we have to recreate the wheel on a lot of this because other communities honestly have done a really good job of, of taking the state material. So in the near term, we, we can work with that. Um, what we've seen of those, many of those or most of those are not translated. Um, and we do agree it's really important to, to make sure this information goes out in multiple languages. And, and that'll take a little bit of time and effort, as well as building together the pieces that are reflective of what we're doing in San Jose. Those, that piece of in, those pieces of information will, will need to be developed thoughtfully. So that, that'll take a little bit of time and a little bit of money. Um, and we're not asking for more money. We're, we're uh, at the moment, we're looking for uh, just a little bit of time to put it together. And I think lastly, um, we see there's an opportunity to really work with your offices, work with the community-based operations to keep adding skill set and capacity for them, and then to do more of working with folks like KQED and Business Journal and Mercury News to actually get them information out because it, it needs to be repeated regularly and many times because they get this stuff one time, they're busy, and it goes in the, in the circular file, I think. So, so there's a lot of work that we can do, work that we can do up front, but the yellow light really refers to getting to do it well. It'll take a little bit. So is that something, Nancy, that needs to come back to us through the budget process? Is that what you're saying? Um, and I'll defer to Rosalind and Lee, either the budget process and or, well, hopefully the budget process and not, um, um, Priority setting. Yeah, it would be the budget process. Why, why don't we have Rosalind chime in and then I, I think I have an answer to your question, Council Member. Thanks, Lee. Um, thank you, Council Member Davis. So, uh, another avenue that I think staff can also uh, pursue is regarding the, the funding, the over $800,000 that's in the existing funding. If we can um, get legal review and have City Attorney's Office take a look at that. Uh, funding to see if, in fact, it can be used for these promotional and educational materials, then it certainly makes sense. Then we can just use that existing funding for the new program. So I think that's something we will definitely pursue right away. Yeah, Great. thank you, Rosalind. And, and that was going to be my suggestion as well. And then just, just picking up, um, I think what I'm hearing Nancy say, um, and maybe the difference, which is why it was yellow light. When I look at the memo, it talks about kind of a a campaign and very specific targeting, but if through the recovery process um, and the recovery task force and all of the small business outreach that we do as an organization, whether it's you know business license tax or Office of Economic Development and their existing workload, if we can integrate this work into that so they're made aware of these programs, then yes, it's a green light if okay. that is the wish of the Rules Committee. Well, I think I'm, I would like us to get the information out as quickly as possible through the channels that we have. And, you know, I don't want to make the perfect enemy of the good. I, I know I say that a lot, but I really think that getting this stuff out with the, the serial filer now making his way down Lincoln Avenue um, and, and hitting multiple businesses in my district just in the last month. Um, the sooner we can get the information out, the better. I do want to also say, um, honestly, that one of the uh, hesitations I think that businesses might have, and this is speculation on my part, but from conversations with businesses and other folks who have gone through inspections, there, there would be a concern that there's going to be some gotcha there and a concern about what if they find something I actually can't afford to do. So if there is any anything in the materials that could give um, some reassurances to the businesses about those issues, that would be very helpful to have in those materials because part of the reason, I, I, I would be shocked if I was wrong about this, part of the reason why we're not having the uptake is there is some fear about getting inspections and then getting hit with either fines from the city or timelines they can't meet or 
you know, something that's costly that they can't afford to do. And so it's kind of like not going to the doctor when something's wrong because you're afraid of what the results might mean. I think that's what we're seeing. And we need to be able to address that underlying issue so that we can actually get to better accessibility that, again, may not be perfect, but is better than what exists right now. And also gives that protection for the businesses to say, hey, we're working on this. We're making headway. It is part of our, you know, our expense plan going forward. We just may not be able to do everything all at once. Point well taken. Thank you. Thank you, council member. I, I'm not gonna give a long presentation because I think council member Esparza actually did an outstanding job of uh, summarizing uh, the issue. But uh, I, I will say that we tried to put together a comprehensive uh, memo uh, to try to address education outreach, as well as providing resources for these businesses that have been impacted by these uh, drive-by ADA lawsuits. Um, if you had an opportunity to look at the um, uh, attachment A, um, Council Member Perales, whose hand I just saw raised, um, is getting hammered with these lawsuits. Uh, in 2020, uh, in, in the zip code 95112, there was, there's been uh, 65 of them. Uh, so in San Jose is the number one city in California for these types of lawsuits. So it's a, it's a major issue and a problem for our small businesses, particularly our ethnically owned businesses. Uh, if you can't, you know, if they don't understand uh, what the potential um, suit is all about, or if someone comes and says, you know, you need to give me money, otherwise I'm going to take you to court or I'm going to sue you. And there's a lot of fear in, in, um, in the community in terms of these lawsuits. So. Uh, I appreciate uh, my council, fellow council colleagues that uh, are partnering with me to, to move this forward. And I, I definitely agree that the two memos complement each other. And uh, Lee, I wanted to um, just kind of ex expand on uh, council member Davis's question. Uh, there's $848,000 in the revolving uh, fund. Is that an adequate amount of money to at least uh, move uh, the items that you had as, as yellow into the green column and, and be able to put together a plan to move forward to um, implement some of these programs and initiatives? Well, I would say based off of what I, I thought were on the forms, we would be tapping into some of that 800,000 for a variety um, of things related to this program, not just communications, but um, I would think if we were going to hold true to number two of um, the Perales, Davis, and Esparza memo, and, and it was kind of a, a very targeted campaign and very robust, that 800000 would be more than enough um, to focus in on that work. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Well, again, uh, I appreciate all the, um, the hard work and effort of um, all the council members. I think everyone is in agreement that this is a, a major issue for our, our businesses, something that we need to address as quickly as possible. Um, Council Member Davis, you said they're starting to make their way down Lincoln Avenue. They're on the, on the west side and they're throughout the city and we need to do something to address it. Uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor, and thank you to um, Council Member uh, Davis and Esparza as well. I think. They said it well, so I'll echo those comments. And you um, have highlighted uh, the 95112 area, which is actually Japantown and North 13th Street. And um, that's where we had, actually, when I was coming into office um, seven years ago, um, we had a number of small businesses uh, that, were, that were targeted, like we've seen happen now throughout our city. And unfortunately, a couple of those ended up having to close up shop, uh, mom and pop shops. And uh, it's just, that was my first introduction to this, and uh, we try to do our part for uh, District 3 and like Japantown and then the downtown core as that started to get hit. And it just really, um, every time this, this happens, uh, it feels 
uh, like such a daunting task because of, of um, these individuals hiding behind this ADA law and, and really taking advantage of it. And um, I think, you know, to the extent of, of whatever we can do possible to try and um, prepare our small businesses for this, I, I still think that's, you know, this is just the local effort, right? I think um, we, we, we want to see some change uh, up at the federal level and, and really looking forward to, to those opportunities as well. Um, but to the extent that we can do more here locally, I'm very interested. So I was excited to see that there are six of us, uh, right? That, that through, through two different act, Brown Acts that are uh, in alignment with this direction and um, uh, appreciate the, the motion. And I know, you know, not, not to try and, right, force staff to do anything that, that you're not capable of. Um, and I don't think any of us would ask that of you, um, right? We wanna be able to give you the resources you need and not ask too much of you but I do agree with Councilmember Davis in this regard is, is we don't want uh, to, to have perfect be the enemy of, of the good here. And, and if we can get out some, even, you know, a little bit of information may help somebody in this regard, and it may not be the best. Um, we're obviously asking for something very robust. Uh, we had a lot of minority owned businesses that were targeted. Um, and so clearly the language barrier is there. And if we're not getting, uh, you know, information out in multi-languages, that's a challenge. Uh, but we need to be taking some steps, and if we have uh, resources to do so, that's what we're looking for. And so, uh, I'm going to be supportive of the motion, and and then look forward to working this out with staff to see how far we can push now with the resources we have, and then ultimately, if if um, we need more um, or we need to refine some of the asks, then then you know we're here to work with you to do that. So thanks. Thank you, Council Member um, Lee. In terms of bringing it back to council, would that be in the form of an info memo or actually bringing it back to council? Yeah, so I think uh, as a team, it'd be good for, for Nancy, Sarah, and Rosal and I to regroup. And uh, I'd like to better understand that funding uh, pot and, and what we can legally do. Um, if we need to appropriate it for something specific, if it's not already there for a specific use, we would need to bring it back to council. If we don't need to do that if it's appropriated for this type of work. Um, I would think we can follow up with the council via uh, an info memo, but if we can have the flexibility to do either there, that'd be great. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Raul, you still had your hand up, did you? Did you have any additional comments? No, I'm sorry, I apologize. No worries. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, Ruth? Davis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Perales? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda is uh, approve the <coughs> auditor's office monthly report of activities for the month of November, 2021. Go ahead, Joe. Hello, good afternoon, uh, council members. So before you is our monthly report of activities for the month of November. Um, in November, we issued our Team San Jose audit. We also had our annual peer review or biannual peer review, which is the next item on the agenda. Um, we, the balance of our work plan is in the attachment. The next item up is our annual services report, which we'll be probably be hoping to be releasing it before the break. Uh, and then, the, as you can see, there's a number of projects in progress. Happy to answer any questions, uh, and I ask that you accept the report. Great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm going to go to the public. Uh, Blair? Go ahead, Blair. All right, the mute button just came on here. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry I'm harassed a bit in, in speaking at public comment time. Uh, I have really good intentions in writing public at public comment time. Uh, it's sad that I have to be harassed a bit. Uh, sad state of things uh, of our lives, but onward we go. Um, I'm trying to learn to, to, there's a lot of good issues uh, and items that are on a, uh, auditing report each month that I think uh, can 
can all parts of the community I hope would be interested in. Uh, there's wage theft prevention policy issues they're working on, uh, a childhood uh, child uh, bill of rights for children and youth ideas, uh, our city forest equity pledge ideas. Um, our city forest ideas, um, that is a concept that uh, you're, you're talking to the state of California uh, uh, about issues right now. Uh, I know other cities around the Bay Area are as well at this time. Um, I've talked often about the ideas of a uh, um, you know, natural disaster preparedness we have to do at this time. I'm sorry this past year I've come on too strong about that issue a bit. I've tried to make it clear what we possibly have to prepare for, but maybe not. And I, I this next year I have to learn to practice the maybe not. <laughs> you know, 2023 actually may be a year that we really get our act together and, and bring the ideas of uh, equity and reimagine and, and renewable energy ideas all to a really important good future purpose. We all get it together and how we're gonna work through the rest of the decade. I gotta learn to speak about that more, but yet still be you know, worried and planning and preparing for natural disaster things to learn how to incorporate natural disaster things naturally into uh, you know, the future ideas of equity and reimagine and health and human services can simply be a really good thing to be learning at this time. And it can be, uh, you know, comfortable and relaxed how we can learn how to do this to for our good future practices and preparedness. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Christopher Mahorsky. Um, so I would really, I would accept the work with you. So my comments are- I can barely hear you, Paul. Uh, can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay. Um, the comments that I'm making are not directly towards you, Joe, I respect your work. Your work is, I think, uh, under, under uh, acknowledged because you go through literally every single department and create these, these, these audits. You're looking at where is the money going? How is it going? Is it being applied? Do we need to you know, uh, uh, ensure that this, these monies go through this stream? And so I respect your work. However, it's about time. I, we, the city can't wait any longer. The documents that have been produced and put into the public record that state that equity has been applied to these documents are false. Those are lies. Okay, that means that the document is actually illegal because you haven't, you did not apply because you can't even define it. And that's why, you know, I need that definition. I need it like now. And, and, and you know what? As a Chicano, I have that right. I have that coming. Chinese, they're the ones that are getting the apologies for what has happened in the city, okay? Vietnamese have been here since 1975. Chicanos, been here for centuries. Natives, centuries. So there's, we can't wait any longer. We need the actual definition, not the aspiration that you gave a couple weeks ago. That was insulting. That was really insulting that, they, that this city was willing to give that sorry definition and then expect someone like me to accept that. No, uh, uh I know what a legal definition of equity is like. Why? Because I experienced every single inequity that this city has dished out and it's not acceptable any longer, not acceptable. And the fact that you guys are comfortable with it, you're very, very comfortable not doing it. That, that's, there's something wrong with that. And so I would like to know when is the equity definition? All right, that was, the last public speaker. Move approval. Thank you. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Ruth? Davis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Perales? Yes. Jones? <laughs> Aye. Thank you. All right, um, next is external quality control review of the office of the city auditor for the period July 1st. 2019 to June 30th, 2021. Go ahead, Joe. So good afternoon, Jeroy City Auditor again. So under government, government auditing standards, our office is required to undergo a peer review of our annual processes to ensure our work complies with government auditing standards issued by the Comptroller of the United States. And under the city charter, we're to undergo this peer review every two years. 
In November, auditors from the cities of Houston and Texas were in our office to review our audit work, and I'm happy to report that in their opinion, our internal control quality control system is designed and operates in a manner that ensures compliance with government auditing standards. In addition, the auditors noted a few areas where they felt the office excels. First, they found that we have developed an audit template, produced organized and well-documented work papers. Next, they found our approach to training staff, including a formal new hire orientation plan, as well as establishing individual professional development plans to promote staff development. And finally, they noted that our policies and procedures, which guide our work in accordance with auditing standards, were clear and easy to understand. They did have one recommendation for improvement, noting that several auditors were activated as disaster service workers during 2020 in different roles. They recommended better documentation up front about the services provided in those roles. They did recognize the dynamics and fluid nature of the COVID response, but getting clarity and agreement with the administration about non-audit work at that outset was important. I ask that you accept the peer review report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Joe. If I were gonna summarize that, that means the audit, we passed. the audit, all right. We passed our audit. That's great. So that would be really embarrassing if the C auditor didn't pass an audit. Um, I'm gonna go to the public first. Uh, Go ahead, Blair. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Um, I remember when the auditors were in town and you introduced them and I, I wish I'd said something. I wish I said a hello at the time. I didn't, unfortunately. Um, I, I was interested how, you know, uh, people from Houston and, and Austin, uh, they would they would view our, our renewable energy practices and what we do in, in that field. Uh, I think it could be of great help to them um, in what they're going through in, in Texas at this time as a learning process. And, and what you're doing uh, in overall good ideas of equity with auditing uh, that can help uh, cities like Oakland and, and, and make comparisons uh, and helpful ideas. I've just overall been really, uh, it's interesting when, when in that you describe the issue and that people came to town to, uh, to review our better practices of ourselves. So um, yeah, thanks for this item and a reminder of it and, and how we can exchange ideas, the importance of exchanging ideas and what that can follow. Obviously, I think PG&E has got some problems and we're trying to address their business competitive nature and try to really uh, bring that down and, and slow it down. And uh, people in Texas really have to learn those lessons, the uh, electricity corporations there. Hey, Blair. Uh, you know. All right, I'll, I'll be done uh, on that topic. Uh, but just to uh, thank you for the overall connections that we can make in, in uh, different people from different parts of the country uh, meeting up and learning to talk with each other about their practices. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for leaving 28 seconds. Uh, Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, this uh, audit, that, that's cool, but Austin, Texas, Sam Houston, Steve Austin, remember 1836, the uh, takeover, they did the same thing to Texas and then they made their way to California. So I don't trust, I don't trust Austin, I don't trust Houston, and I certainly don't trust Texas. So to legitimize a document and then legitimize your practices using Texas as the standard by which it's validated, you're talking to a Chicano that understands his history. And so th this, is, this is why, give me the equity definition that you used or that they applied there but Texas doesn't have one because Texas doesn't care about equity. We're talking about a state that had the Texas Rangers, the Texas Rangers, who literally used to just lynch Mexicans on the same level that they were lynching blacks. <laughs> so I'm sorry that, you know, I can't accept the legitimacy that they have given to these documents because I still remember the histories that have not been vindicated because they have never been reckoned with. And the city is failing with the red line. The red lining map must be reckoned with because from it flowed all kinds of vile diseases. And the disease was white supremacy in the city. Was that in your documents? Do you think Texas would affirm that if they spotted it? No, because it's normalized to them. It's normal. And to certain people here in the city, it's normal to be doing what it is that they're doing now. 
you know, San Carlo advocating for uh, the uh, Chinese earlier today. That one has was that in your audit? They were, were were they saying that they that Chinese and and Vietnamese are now uh, the ones that they're going to be advocating for? That was evidenced by Perales acknowledging them. All right. Bringing it back to the committee, can we get a motion to show that we uh, support the Sea Otter passing their audit? So moved. Motion to approve. All right, I'll take that as a motion in a second. Um, Ruth? Davis? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Perales? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay, the last item on the agenda is um, open forum. So I'm gonna go to the public and Paul, you're up first. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I really have to acknowledge um, Councilwoman Esparza and, and Carrasco and Arenas for what they've been doing for the past couple uh, days because I see it, I hear it in your voices and the memo that was produced by Esparza and, and Carrasco with respect to articulating what the history is. Oh? During the felon statute removal. Talk about push, yeah. Oh, I lost you for a second, keep going. Okay, well, the park, Proust Park, when that, when the city came in and they said, yeah, Proust Park on 680, uh, uh, 280 and 101. They couldn't even come out of their mouth and say King's story. Why? Because that would draw attention to the barrio. It would draw attention. We put the response of the sons and daughters of Campesinos that were suffering on the east side. You know what our response was? The lowrider movement. That's what we did. They paved over uh, Bud Winterfield. Bud Winterfield was when, in 1968, the Chicano commencement happened. And what they did is because it was only 1%, 1% of the population of Mexicans in this city were allowed at San Jose State University. They walked out in protest of that fact. And they walked over to the Bud Winterfield, the same field where Tommy Smith and Juan Carlos took to the stage, took to the world stage in Mexico City in 1968, just a couple months after that. And they showed the world who was bad on that day. And they were in support with the Panthers and they removed their shoes. Why? Because they knew that you, whenever it is that you're in a position of power, you always create a solidarity with those that have none. That's what the removal of the shoes symbolized and the raised fist. So th 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 this city really needs to get to a point to where we can look at these things square in the eye and accept it with you. Thank you, uh, Blair. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Um, as, as, as important as community safety is for issues uh, uh, towards public health and, and the such, I, I think in this country, we, we can have a few more choices to be like a bit more flexible in how we view the future of the vaccine process. I think making these vaccine mandates is not quite the way to go yet. I think we have a bit of time and room to better consider, you know, mask use and 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 practices that you know people are concerned about what the vaccine is is about, and we need to, you guys really need to learn to be more open with ourselves and practice how to be more open about the process. That's how we learn. We're not in a process process in a state of war. We're learning to leave the state of war in its secrecy. Learn to learn good practices. You know how to respect ourselves. And that brings a maturity to the conversation. That's how you address community safety. Um, that's how you teach, you know, our young people right now who are looting so much and going crazy because they're, they're apathetic as anything. They don't care. I mean, we've developed a, a bad system. Let's show what we are doing well. Let's do our good practices well and, and, and invite a maturity to this process. We need to be communicating better, like with Oakland and, and San Jose need to be connecting about, you know, they're going through the same things with, with crime issues. We need to solve these things by being open and decent and honest with each other and invite the looters themselves to what can be our better practices and our better future and our better ideals. How do we do that? 
It isn't hiding everything. It isn't keeping things secretive. You know, let's do it openly. Let's get it out there for everybody. Good luck with the uh, PG&E issues. Um, you know, let's rally and ask them to stop this uh, solar thing they're on. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Gail. Hi, good evening. Um, so I'm back again. Um, yesterday, it was five weeks that I've been emailing, calling, taking tours at phase three at Columbus Park. Today, I, I gave a tour, that sounds kind of funny, to um, Rotary people, a person from Rotary, and they were absolutely appalled at what they saw. Well, everybody is. Um, I also want to say that I'm very, very disappointed. In, I'm sorry, Raul, Councilman, I'm very disappointed in you for not stepping up and taking the ball and, and trying to get these porta potties moved. To my knowledge, you haven't. I've been very involved. I've taken people there. There seems to be a roadblock. I, I don't get it. I, I've talked to certain people. Like I've mentioned before, they haven't done anything. Um, hopefully, um, it's going to be taken care of. But I have no support from you, um, your office, Ms. Um, Raul, because um, I don't know why. Uh, we have a problem with a man out there. We call him the woodchucker. It's going to be a fire. It's a disaster waiting to happen. If you've ever seen all the wood that he has out there, it's going to be another ghost ship happening because the fire is going to happen. And this man needs to be posted, needs to be taken out of there. Um, it's a disaster. And you've all seen it probably at heading um, and spring. Well, now you can't get into it, but um, something has to be done with him. Uh, what we saw today, I have pictures, was astounding. I couldn't even believe what I was looking at. This company dropping off these huge trees, huge. And nobody's doing anything. Do you want this to be another ghost ship happening? I'm sorry, but nobody is stepping up. This camp needs to be taken care of and nobody is doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Scott? Thank you, everyone. Scott Largent. Uh, Gail basically knocked it out of the park right there. Um, she's bringing a lot of things to your attention right now that are going on out there at Columbus Park, out at Spring Street. Uh, you know, I could just keep beating the same drum, but I'm going to basically keep it focused on the woodchucker. So this guy out there, he used to be my neighbor out there uh, until he burnt his entire well, I believe it was like a three-story structure with like a uh, gunner's tower on top and several mirrors and, and solar panels. I mean, it was just a, a meth maze. So this guy has burnt this thing down multiple times. Um, the letters are flooding into City Hall. They're going to, of course, Councilman Perales, they're, they're going to your office. And the neighbors, the business owners are just dying over this stuff. The storage center across the street, every unit just reeks of smoke. Um, this man is out there burning wood that should not be burned during spare the air days, which I am just absolutely shocked that the city hasn't done anything about. He has now rebuilt the meth shack um, again. And we had a fire there two or three days ago. People could, could not get out where the K rails are at, so they drove straight through that wooden fence right there. This man now has brought in more wood, more trees now, and he has completely blocked everything. I mean, these things are massive tree trunks that are out there. So he's worked a deal with all these different tree trimming companies that it's okay to dump everything they have out there. And then it's okay for him to have a burn pile as if we live in Oregon. Okay, I don't even think burn, uh, I don't even think we have any prescribed burn days here that are even legal or possible. Somebody from code enforcement, from the fire marshal, needs to get out there now. Please, Council Member Perales, I've spoke about this a lot today at different meetings. Get on the horn and get somebody out. Thank you. Uh, Catherine? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I want to um, agree with the last two speakers. Um, that absolutely should not be happening. It's one thing to say don't criminalize homelessness. It's another thing to say it's okay to... Uh, be creating major fire safety issues, you know, is 
under the approach the airport and close to businesses and menacing the other people who don't have anywhere else to go um, somebody needs to enforce the laws on him instead of just you know looking the other way until it all burns down and everybody can be like oh that was so sad but at least it's gone now um and there's something else i was going to talk about what was it um i forgot the other thing i was going to talk about something and somebody else would say oh yes um i don't think that we should be looking at both sides of medical issues any more than we should be looking at both sides of fire safety. Um, if masks, I mean, if people were actually complying with masks and social distancing, and that would fix the pandemic, we wouldn't have a pandemic. Um, the Bay Area has really good vaccine uptake. And I'm more concerned about people who are afraid that they're going to miss work and miss pay. I don't know what can be done to make sure that uh, hourly workers are compensated for any time they miss because they feel poorly after the vaccine for a few days because that's just what your immune system does. It doesn't, it's not like a side effect. It's just your immune system having a fire drill basically. And uh, I don't think we should be going backwards on requirements for city workers at the city. Thank you. Call in user one. Are you, are you, is everyone in city council hearing this, hearing what you're not doing? Cause I know Raul Peral is, he's concerned about how much tax they're getting from the marijuana. That's what he wants, right? Does he care about you as a local resident? Why these guys are destroying this park, lighting fires, and everything else? Does he care? No. I mean, what would he expect? A former cop, former teacher. I mean, just a city council person. Three strikes, you're out, Raul. Sorry, buddy, but you are. And uh, not not doing his work, not caring about the public. And look what happens. This is what happens when your city council wants to have adult tricycles, scooters. They like to arrange abortions you know, over state lines just in case someone in Mississippi uh, misses their period. They're going to bring them here and get an abortion. This is what they, this is what they like to concentrate on. Uh, a mass transit system to nowhere that's not ever going to work, that nobody uses, that costs billions of dollars. That's what they focus on. They focus on your shed in your backyard. They focus on if you have a flagpole that's too high, but they allow this to happen. Hey, you're the homeowner. You're, you got your, 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 your bumper over in the sidewalk. You're going to get a citation if, if the bumper is, is uh, over on the sidewalk when you got your car parked in the driveway. Hey, wait a minute. They're going to fine you if there's a work truck unloading some sod to redo your front lawn. But, hey, by all means, let that happen at Columbus Park. Let a complete uh, 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 destruction of a park and a city and people's peace, peace and quiet. Yeah, that's what the city council does. You focus on everything that's wrong, all you people in city council. You're irresponsible. You're rude. You're inconsiderate. And that's what you're doing to this public. Thank you. A ray of sunshine on a cloudy day. Uh, go ahead, Jill. Hi, well, on that night, note, I'll just tell you how much I appreciate all of you before I give my comment. Um, as somebody who suffers from um, migraine disease, uh, even though I would love to be a part of doing much more in my life and at city council, the fact of the matter is I would never be able to do the job that you do. And so uh, really thank you. We don't always have to agree, that's okay, but I do thank you. And I am hearing all of these negative comments and want you to know they, they really hurt my heart. I'm a sensitive person, it drives me nuts. But anyway, okay, a minute 30 left to talk to you about what I really wanna say, which is that um, I wanna ask you, what type of response do we expect, excuse me, do you expect, or does the city expect of developers and those associated with developers, for example, their partners, their presenters of projects and so forth, what type of response do you expect them to have to people in the community? 
um, I would imagine you want them to be responsive and to include us in the process. But I have reached out on numerous occasions to Jonathan Imami and Leslie Guardino, who are both people that have apparently purchased the property at the fish market off of Blossom Hill Road, which is the um, urban village that I'm in. And I'm what I I did I did not attend the first meeting, did not know about the first meeting. Um, the number on the sign was not the same number they're using now. There's a lot of inconsistencies and issues. But my question is to you is when you're talking to these developers about these projects, I hope that you will um, encourage them to call people back that are interested in um, their project. I'm actually very supportive of their seven story project and would like to have a good design and to be a big part of of making it move forward, but I can get no response from them. So please encourage those people to um, interact with people in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. And I would encourage you to work through your council office and uh, try to get connected there. That's the last public speaker. So this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>